Uh, Lindsay, very much so. Um, I've been in a number of uh, engagements with people where it is the bubbling under uh, area. Over the years that I've been here, social media, which I knew nothing about when the WEF were already talking about it, has come to the fore. Gl uh, climate change as well has been something that was discovered for the, for the uh, conversation, if you like, here long before it, it became ubiquitous. And now it's all about inequality. It's all about income distribution. So it is a, a major issue. But let's uh, talk to someone who's a most unlikely person to be here in uh, in, in, on CNBC Africa being a business channel. First of all, he's a prince from Belgium. And secondly, he runs a national park in the most unlikely place in the world, in the DRC. Um, yes, that's right. I work for the National Park Service um, in, in Congo in a national park called Virunga National Park, where I've been working as director for, for the past um, seven years. Now, we do know that Belgium's got a historic uh, relationship with the DRC, but you wouldn't expect someone like you, to be A, living there, and B, to be running a national park. You must have a story. Um, well, my story has always been very much tied to the continent. I was born in North Africa. I grew up in Kenya, and then I spent most of my professional life in, in the Congo. Um, I arrived there in 1993 um, working with the National Park Service. So I've been there ever since. Why were you drawn to that in particular? Because it's a, there was an assassination attempt on your life, according to Wikipedia, uh, about a year ago? Um, well, I, um, I was drawn to Virunga because I, I've been a conservationist for, a, for a far, as far back as I can remember. Um, and Virunga is the, the oldest national park on, on the African continent. But it's also its richest in terms of um, its, its biological value. Um, it has more species of, of reptiles, mammals and birds than any other park in the world. Um, and of course, there are the, the mountain gorillas that are such an attraction. But what, what really kept me in, in Virunga for all those years is the incredible commitment of the, of the Congolese, and particularly the Congolese rangers, who have been struggling to keep this park alive and has, have been very successful in doing so against incredible, um, incredible odds and um, with you know, facing such, su such threats to the park but also to their own security. But your security, they, they're there, they're part of the country, you have options, clearly. Mm. Why, uh, why, why would people want to attack you in that way? Um, well, in 2008, I was appointed as their, as their commanding officer, so I became part of the, um, the um, uh, I became a public servant in the Congolese administration, working for the Congolese government. Um, and so I have to share the risks that they take. That's the decision you make when you join public service, when you become a, a serviceman, as it were. Um, and of course, um, you know, what happened to me has to be seen in context. Um, 140 of our staff have been killed um, since the beginning of the war in, in 1990, 1996. Um, many, many more have been wounded. Um, I, was, I was injured. I survived. You know, the decision to, to stay is a decision you make when you sign up. Um, and of course, when you know, the, the people who, who are working with you make that commitment, it's, it's, it's very motivating. Um, and, and so you, you keep going. Do you get support by the people that you're meeting here in Davos? Uh, the story you're telling now is one that is not universally known, but amongst the elites that you would be bumping into here, do they hear your story and, and say, we'd like to help Virunga? Um, yes. I mean, we, you know, we live in the real world. Um, and Virunga has been drawn into a much wider context. Um, it's, um, it's been um, pulled into this terrible war that's been um, um, affecting eastern Congo that has led to the death of over six million Congolese. Um, and we're right at the center of that. Every war since 1996 has started either within um, the national park or immediately around it. Um, and so we're drawn into one of the biggest regional conflicts in Africa, one of the most tragic um, wars since the Second World War. Um, but also we're affected with these um, economic realities. Um, one of the, the, the great confrontations that we're facing at the moment is the issue of illegal oil um, in the National Park, which is in this case a, a British oil company. Um, and it's, it, it's something that the law enforcement authorities that, that we are as a National Park Service have to confront. And it's, it's extremely difficult and we can't do it on our own. Um, we're completely disempowered if we tackle it in isolation. And so we have to come to these kinds of fora um, to draw 
the world's attention on these issues and try and make progress. Do they get it, though? And I ask this in the context of the tragedy in Paris a couple of weeks ago uh, at Charlie Hebdo, um, and the, the point you've just made now that 140 of your people who are just trying to protect mm. a game reserve have lost their lives in service and pretty much no one knows about it. Well, of course, you know, the, the, the world's attention is always drawn to, you know, Western capitals when, when tragedies happen there. Um, and, you know, the horrors that are happening, in particular in Africa, are so often forgotten. Um, but, you know, we have to remember that we live more and more in a world where everything is interlinked. Um, and um, we're also living in a world which is becoming increasingly violent. Um, and it becomes very important now to try and really put the effort into understanding the, the root causes of that violence and often it is related to resource extraction um, there has been a lot of work to try and understand the horrors that have been happening in eastern Congo um, and we're beginning to realize that um, these wars um, this incredible level of violence is tied to the illegal extraction of, of natural resources um, in eastern Congo and so it becomes very important to try and examine this to share this in, in this kind of forum on a brighter note how do I come and visit you? How do, how do tourists from South Africa, in fact from the whole of Africa, come and visit Virunga? Is it safe? Um, well, of course, there, there is a brighter side to all of this, and we wouldn't carry on if we didn't have enormous hope that we can turn the situation around. And, of course, a big part of that is tourism. Um, tourism is a, a, tr a transformational industry that can create an enormous amount of employment around the national park, and it's by creating employment um, that you can move out of this, this chronic state of civil war. Um, and it is possible to visit Virunga because, you know, the park, the park staff, the rangers, have worked incredibly hard to stabilize certain parts of the park, like where the mountain gorillas are um, and this incredible volcano, this active volcano that people come and visit. So actually more than 6,000 people have come to visit it in the last few years. Um, and they've all, you know, they've all enjoyed the, 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 the experience immensely and have, have been able to go there safely um, and, and enjoy the, 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 you know, the best that, that Congo has to offer. The dividends of peace must be huge. Uh, we were talking yesterday with a Turkish prime minister mm. who said they have 35 million tourists a year. Virunga gets 6,000, so I guess the upside. Yes, but it's growing very fast. You know, when you start from zero, your growth is impressive. Um, and so um, we do expect it to grow very fast in the next few years, and, and that's where, that's where our, our hope lies. Our thanks to Prince Emmanuel de Minot.